Hello, I'm Dr. Len Baer, the host of Targeted Justice v. Garland, a podcast about an extraordinary lawsuit. This is week 38, and we are continuing with dissecting our legal brief, which has been filed in the Court of Appeals uh, just recently on September 5th by our uh, plaintiff's um, attorney, Anna Toledo, who continues to impress us with her productivity and attention to details uh, like I've never seen before. Anna, uh, please say good morning to our viewers. Good morning, Len, and good morning, everybody out there, and good morning, Tyrone. Uh, Looking forward to my highlight of my week. Thank you, Len, for this. And our special guest today is Mr. Tarun Ravi. I met Tarun when he contacted me with this um, a legal case in India that we mentioned in our previous podcast. And we will be a, a part of our conversation will be about that. But Tarun is a targeted individual for over 20 years. Uh, he's a naturalized uh, a U.S. citizen. He resides in, I believe, in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. Uh, currently, he is visiting India. And we would like to welcome Tarun to the show. Good morning, Tarun. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Len Baer, and good morning, Anna. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be on your podcast so I can explain uh, my side of the story. Uh, I have been a targeted individual for more than 20 years so far. And I have plenty of things to you know, t- tell the TI community in uh, America and the entire world. Tarun, we will be speaking to you in the second part of the show. But first, our legal segment, which I will start with the slides I prepared. Okay. Anna, do you have any special announcement for today's legal segment? Well, I have one little announcement which has no, nothing to do, but a lot to do with our case, which is uh, that the Missouri versus Biden, the you know, uh, Department of Justice went to the Supreme Court, which I think it's a huge mistake because um, <laughs> they, it will be confirmed. Uh, the decision of the Fifth Circuit uh, concluding that the FBI intimidated and uh, forced Twitter to uh, monitor the content. You know, they went into Twitter. They had their own little field office there and uh, uh, monitoring content and, and, and taking down content of people that I am absolutely certain is the content of targeted individuals. We have discussed this previously, but that a uh, development happened yesterday that they filed a uh, uh, certiorari to the Supreme Court. And I just think it's a big mistake. I think everything is connected, and I'm sure it will have an impact on all the cases surrounding the FBI and treatment of civilians by the FBI. We are continuing to analyze our legal brief filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And if you remember, in the last episode, we reviewed three things. Statements regarding oral argument, why we asking for the oral argument on bank, uh, meaning we asked all the judges to be present. We talked about the uniqueness of the case, which was my favorite part, and issues presented for review. And going further into the legal brief, the next part, the portion of the legal brief is called statement of the case and it's broken into five parts Uh, it has procedural background it has legal backgrounds it has a part uh, called plaintiff's appellants it has a section about plaintiff's claims and finally it has a section about the decisions which is broken into a and b and the a is called false and misleading statements so today we're jumping right into that section 5a called false and misleading statements and if you can guess how many false and misleading statements anna has presented in her legal brief the answer is 22. There are 22 of them. We don't have time for 
all of them today. So today is just the first part. We will review the first 10 false and misleading statements. So that's the plan. Let's get to it. The number one, the plaintiffs pled only conclusory allegations that they are on the alleged blacklist, much less harmed by their inclusion on the list. And the counter argument that Anna presents is plaintiff Stewart and Calvert describe how they learned of their inclusion on the list. Anna, do you have any comments? Sure. First of all, I want to I want to commend you on this because it is very important for our TI community to be empowered through knowledge. This case, once they understand the concepts, the legal reasons behind this case, they can understand why it's a case that will benefit and will set everyone free. As I've always repeated, no names, no targets. This first statement, okay, th this is the second time in my 30 years as an attorney that I have encountered a, a decision by a court that contains um, a false or misleading statements. It is very hard for me, with all due respect, I, 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 I pointed them out with utmost respect because, uh, you know, as part of our duty as attorneys is to be um, respectful of the courts. And I, I try to do it with utmost respect. So, you you know, when I speak, I, I try to do it a, that way. That's number one. So the only other time uh, I encountered a such either false or misleading statements in a decision was, you know, back, back home when I didn't know I was targeted yet. And it wasn't a judge. It was a um, a master, uh, a master appointed in a case. So uh, this is the first time I see it happening from a decision from a court per se. In this particular case, conclusory allegations, it would be like, for example, if I said they did it wrong or they did it, you know, without stating facts. It's basically saying uh, they uh, placed them there without uh, or they did it illegally, for example. They place them there illegally, just like that. But no, when you say why it's illegal to place targeted individuals or non-investigative subjects on the list, because they don't represent a terrorist threat pursuant to FBI own submissions, which we have said. So in this particular case, for example, Calvert, eh, I'm not going to read the the entire thing but you know while he was on the floor with a medical emergency because he had these blood clots um suffering from severe blood clots two deputy sheriffs of the Brasoria County did not allow the ambulance to drive up the driveway to take him to the hospital instead the deputies sheriffs asserted they could not allow anyone into the premises until they inspected them thoroughly since they had to secure the area because they had been told that a suspected terrorist lived, lived there. Those are specific statements of fact that are being alleged. That is not a conclusory allegation like the court expressed in its uh, decision. Uh, the, the other one is with Karen Stewart, which is the same, you know, Karen Stewart, uh, I mentioned this before, but she explains how she visited Leon County Sheriff Department in or around mid-2016 to plead in per help for help because of the daily crimes, the gang stalking crimes she was suffering and her elderly parents and her pets. And uh, the sheriff, the, the sher deputy sheriff in charge at that moment, flipped through 10 to tw 20 folders in the trunk of his car, asked for her name again, and then so, you know, went through a list and then said, I cannot talk to you anymore. I cannot help you anymore. So th those and and in the Fifth Circuit, there is precedent that says that even one, but here we have two plaintiffs that establish the injury. In fact, the standing for themselves, they extends to the rest of the plaintiffs. So the introduction that I made uh, in the brief as to these False statements is very important for people to understand. Without these either erroneous conclusions or misleading statements, the court could not have 
reach the decision it did, which is contrary to law also. But when decisions from the court come, they usually have the conclusions of fact and then the conclusions of law. So if you have wrong conclusions of fact, then you can reach wrong conclusions of law. And that is our argument. So there you have it. That And, and about the second part, much less harmed. I, I, I didn't even have to go into that because, you know, the, the complaint is full of allegations of how they are harmed, particularly just being labeled a suspected terrorist uh, secretly affects all aspects of your life. So that statement can be corroborated with a complaint that is inaccurate, is erroneous, and leads to an erroneous conclusion. Thank you for that explanation, Anna. I thought about this word conclusory versus the word factual. That, to me, is the essence of this uh, misleading statement. When you create a conclusion, it's like you're speculating. It's like you're creating a hypothesis based on the facts. And that's what the judge says. Well, you form this hypothesis. You form this speculation. And you're saying, there's nothing speculative about it. I presented you with facts that they're on the list. And that, to me, is the essence of this arg argument. So we're looking at it from a different perspective, and I'm trying our viewers to understand that whichever explanation fits their framework much better. So great, excellent. You're, to you're totally correct. You're totally correct. It's We stated specific facts, not conclusory allegations. And that is easily corroborated by reading the lawsuit. True. And you viewers, if after this discussion, you cannot explain to a stranger the difference between the conclusory and factual allegations, you have to watch the show one more time. Let's move on. Misleading statement number two. By the way, they're false and they're misleading. Some of them are false and some of them are misleading. Can you explain just briefly the difference between false and misleading, Anna, please? Okay, misleading is to try is to make you, compel you to reach a conclusion that is not necessarily accurate because you're missing. And when I put misleading, it's usually because they're, it's missing an essential component as in this, in the case of this one, okay? Uh, that you're gonna read now. And false is like the other one. It's completely false that there are no factual, well pled facts because it's it, the facts are, are alleged in the complaint. It is not conclusory for Calvert and Stewart, uh, their allegations are not conclusory because they state specifically more on or around this date, on or around this place, these people did this and said this. That is factual, okay? It's not conclusory, but in the in, in, so that can be proven that it's erroneous. In this case, do you want to read it and I'll and I'll explain what is the misleading, you know, the, the, the so you can tell the difference. Okay, let's do this. Uh, so number two, plaintiffs allege that a massive government surveillance and security program has inflicted grave physical and psychological injury on them. And your rebuke is that this statement mischaracterizes the controversy by leaving the main claim out, secret and illegal inclusion on TSDB. And let me let me point out, I actually see where you say that it's misleading because it is like a statement that has an omission. And that's what makes it misleading. So yes, please go ahead, Anna. I'm so glad we're dissecting these statements in uh, so much details. Yeah, well, that statement is clearly makes somebody think that these are conspiracy theorists and people that are just not seeing reality as they should. But here's the here's the big problem about this. It jumps from point A to point C, skipping point B, which is the most important one, which is that admission by the FBI. 
limited exceptions that we now know it's the majority, not limited, to the reasonable suspicion standard exists for the sole purpose of supporting certain screening functions of DHS and state individuals included in the TSDB pursuant to such exceptions are not considered known and suspected terrorists and are not screened as such. This is an admission by the FBI that there are non-terrorists in a terrorist list. And that's what we need TIs to go out there and explain to the world because this, this is the most un-American, unconstitutional practice beyond the FBI's authority that there is. So this statement is misleading because it jumps from plaintiffs alleged a massive government surveillance without stating that they have been illegally, as a result of being illegally placed and, and labeled as suspected terrorists to 18,000 law enforcement, 1,440 organizations, uh, 533 corporations. So all those people and their employees, when you come into their store, that you have a label of suspected terrorist. And that is what why I call the statement misleading because it skips the most important controversy that is really not a controversy because it's an uncontested fact admitted by the FBI that they place innocent non-terrorists on a terrorist list. And that's what's misleading because it's like, oh, it's a conspiracy. No, it has been admitted by the FBI that they put innocent people on a terrorist list, period. And that should not have been skipped because that is the main allegation. And th this this sentence is in the first page of the decision, sort of to imprint the thought that, oh, it's not, it, it doesn't hold water. Yes, I understand. And I am envying the judges of the appellant court because you are making it too easy for them. You literally, given all these explanations, all these findings, on a silver platter. I think the human you are making their job so much easier. That's my opinion. So it's a great job. Let's go to a statement number three. It's a part of a court dismissal. Only harms attributable to agency action are subject to reviews under Administrative Procedure Act, EPA. Amended complaint does not met uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a typo. Uh, amended complaint does not meet the APA standards. And the rebuttal is that plaintiffs have the right to invoke illegal abuses of authority under APA in their request for declaratory judgment. A little bit complicated, so let's explain it to people. Anna. Yeah, well, this this has many aspects to it. First of all, it, yeah, it's more of an erroneous conclusion of fact stated. I mean, of of law stated as a fact because the American Procedure Administrative Procedure Act regulates agency action. But it is courts have recognized that under that that is one of us. You know, in the when you go to court, you have to invoke statutes, right? And that's one of the statutes we invoked because it's abuse of agency discretion. However, we're also alleging the violation of these public officials to their oath of office and to their duties of their, you know, it's, it's not just the FBI and the DHS that are sued. We have sued individuals, uh, uh, public officials in their official and individual capacity for the illegal acts that we have alleged in the complaint, which is placing innocent people on a terrorist list, among other things. So this is, this is just a legally and factually incorrect statement because the Fifth, Fifth Circuit and Supreme Court have recognized that you can invoke the American the Administrative Procedures Act to allege a violation uh, of agency abuse. It's not like a you know you have to go through the administrative procedure. No, 
you it can be alleged as one source, one legal source that gives the court jurisdiction to entertain the case. So that's you know that's also incorrect. And, and the the circuit has precedent. What one of the things that that um I have explained to people in simple terms is that confirming this decision would entail reversing a lot of precedent. And that's why, such as this one, for example, and that's why I really believe that we're going to prevail. Thank you, Anna. I have a follow-up question just so we can better understand this statement, the falsity of it. What would be an example when a complaint would not meet the APA standard? I would say, for example, non, like a discretionary, let's say that I am suing on behalf of my client because the agency failed, let's say, failed to do, to carry out this regulation. And it was really not a mandatory thing. Let, let's put it that way. So, or a mandatory uh, action within the statute that creates the agency. Okay. I'll give you an example. In my wish list, I would like for FCC that now uh, with a recent uh, decision regarding cell towers, that FCC would do, uh, you know, I don't know, X or Y, C about, uh, let's say, epidemiology studies, let's say, epidemiology studies. Well, FCC is going to tell me, no, you cannot invoke abuse of discretion or anything because that's not within the realm of my expertise as an agency. Do you see what I mean? It's like asking for things that I cannot ask for. But when you're talking about an abuse of discretion from that agency, which is so blatant because there are regulations and the agencies have to follow the regulations. In this particular case, let me let me read you something that uh, depicts it really well, which I was, which it's a, a document from the Department of Justice of the United States, Office of Inspector General. And, and just listen to this, uh, because this portrays the abuse of discretion of the agency, which through the mechanism of the Declaratory Judgment Act, you can go petition the court and say, no, look at, look at what they're doing. It says, we learned, this is the Office of Inspector General, we learned that the NCTC, it's a National Counterterrorism Center, is receiving nominations for non-investigative subjects directly from FBI field personnel because this nomination practice is not covered in FBI policy, meaning outside of their authority. There are no requirements for FBI personnel to ensure that any resulting watch list records are updated or removed as appropriate. There is likewise no mechanism to ensure that the nominations directly passed to the NCTC by field personnel are appropriate and that the information is complete and accurate. And then it went on to say, the weaknesses indicate that the potential exists for watch list nominations to be inappropriate, inaccurate, or outdated because the watch list records are not appropriately generated, updated, or removed as required by FBI policy. And that is FBI policy is the key there. The agency, the, the, the legality of the agency actions derive from their compliance with statutes and regulations. And the Administrative Procedure Act allows for citizens to go to court and say this agency is not acting pursuant to its statute and its regulations that make legal their actions. Does that make sense to you? Of course. And I think your comparison and explanation of the FCC complaint and the epidemiology was perfect for us to understand the nature of this complaint. Thank you. Let's move on. Number four, the following summary is taken from the plaintiff's amended complaint. It sounds like an innocent statement. 
But this list of false statements and misrepresentations establishes that the court did not take its summary of pleadings based on amended complaint. This needs an explanation. Anna, please. Well, yes, the rule says, the precedent says that the court must take as true all the well-pled facts of the complaint and read them in the light most favorable to plaintiff. In this case, it is is my contention that what the court took as true and read in the light most favorable was the motions to dismiss and the arguments contained therein. What we stated before and what we're going to state afterwards is going to prove to you, for example, the data set situation that the, the, the court says, for example, a plaintiff state that there uh, there are non-investigative subjects. I, I don't know. It's, we might go later to that. No, no, it's not plaintiffs that state. Plaintiffs allege that in this report or X report, this is what is stated. We did not make up one of the misleading statements that the Department of Justice wanted the court to believe, which it seems the court adopted, is that that plaintiffs made up the term non-investigative subject. However, that term comes from audit reports of the FBI. We didn't make up that term. And if you do a Google search, you'll get 22,000 results in less than a second with that word. That's just one example. And, and and so goes the summary of the allegations are either halfway or, or are misleading. The, the, the summary is not taken from the complaint because at the very least, it will contain the uncontroverted material facts about how innocent people, how FBI admits it puts non-terrorists on a terrorist database. That is nowhere in the decision. Okay, I understand now the core of this false statement is that the court takes the amended complaint as the source of the information, while the amended complaint contains factual pleadings and they just disregard it. They take the amended complaint as the source of all these allegations. Perfectly explained. Thank you, Heather. Number five. The terrorist screening data set is formally and interchangeably known as the terrorist screening database. Well, that is a dangerous statement. <laughs> and you respond perfectly that neither plaintiff alleged this, nor is any legal authority that supports this conclusion. We had a whole episode about the difference between data set in the database. And this hits the core of these problems. We did not allege this, but neither any of the government statements support this conclusion. Do you have any comments on that? The memorandum and order states, expresses the word, uh, writes the word data set 19 times and database only one to say that it's interchangeably used those four terms that is not correct the legal term is database and for those that work you know in statistics accountants all all of those people that don't the difference between a database and a data set know that they're not interchangeable because a data set is an extraction from a database and that's what i i believe united states department of justice is preparing to extract the information, selective information, if they want, they are compelled to produce the information. They're going to extract whatever they want because they want, because you see, people that are innocent non-terrorists on this database have a right to see the information, the false information about them in that database, not what they selectively pull out of it. And so in the first complaint that we filed that we amended uh, subsequently, the first complaint does not contain the word data set. The amended complaint contains, let me see if I have the numbers here, something like 300 and something references to TSDB. And I I don't have here the latest, um, the latest version, but like maybe 19 times, I don't know how many times we, we say terrorist screening database. And in one, one mysterious, paragraph 
the word data, paragraph 25, data set popped in. But the rest 300 and something, it's TSDB and terrorist screening database. So it's not true that we alleged that the data set, since the court is supposed to take as true the allegations and the complaint, never in the complaint did plaintiffs allege that data set and database are interchangeable. That is not correct. And the I did a Westlaw search, and the first time the word data set appeared is in November of 2022, in the case Noor versus unknown uh, CBP officers. And interestingly enough, the court reaches a conclusion that database and data set are interchangeable based on a sworn statement by Samuel Robinson, who is the same person that appeared in our case to say that there's a secret criteria to put non-investigative subjects, innocent civilians in a terrorist database is a secret criteria. Well, based on that statement, sworn to, a statement under penalty of perjury, the court in Virginia, Eastern District of Virginia, concluded that the, the terms are interchangeable. But Mr. Robinson doesn't have the legal authority. He's not Congress and he's not a, 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 the, the executive, you know, like an executive order from the president to say that they are interchangeable terms because they're not. So we are bringing this to the attention of the court because one of the remedies we're asking for is when the case is vacated and remanded uh, to the district court, that plaintiffs get access to the unredacted database because here's what's happened in prior cases challenging the database attorneys have had access to it and if not like i said before and if not attorneys the court to verify the the information on the on the on the persons and but here's the thing those cases as i said before were of people that were in handling coach one and two plaintiffs that are not in handling counts one and two because they never encounter problems when tra up to the filing of the complaint, never encounter problems when traveling. They are innocent people, have no ties to terrorism, were placed illegally on the list, and therefore they have a right to the discovery. And that's what we're asking for, to see the, the, the database records on them. The pursuant to the law, these database records are supposed to be kept for 99 years. So if they changed it this year, we have a right to see from prior years too. And that's what we're going to demand because, you know, in the fact finding, in the discovery, that's what we're going to demand. So this data set formerly known as a TSEB, this was contained in a sworn statement by Mr. Robinson and, and they are trying to push that narrative so that people don't, because they are forced, they were foreseeing, you know, you, you and I know that our devices, somebody hacks them and gets into our computer. So I think that FBI was foreseeing that, that the moment that a case like this would be filed. And so they are trying to, to close the opportunity for the discovery on, on the illegal inclusion of innocent people on the database. And, and that's what this database and data set thing but it's, it's just a matter of law. There is no such thing as a data set other than a creation by FBI trying to prevent plaintiffs from discovering the information they have a right to. Thank you, Anna. That was a perfect explanation. The next statement speaks about exactly that same strange and inexplicable instance when the word data set appeared in just one paragraph of the amended complaint. So the, the statement by the court reads, the plaintiffs allege that they are included in the terror screen database and they allege that their names are included in the handling code three and four subcategories that constitute 97% of the identities in the data set. And your bottle says, correct legal term is TSDB. On only one strange and inexplicable instance, the word data set appears in the paragraph 25th of the amendment complaint. We can speculate how it happened. I think the hack is very likely because under no circumstance, you would use the word data set 
It's not in your vocabulary. It's not in your legal list of terms that you would use. And there were some, as you were describing, there were some strange things happening with your files when you would open and the file would be empty. And so there's some shenanigans going on and we we don't need to hide it. We don't need to be shy about it. Yes, hacking of computers is happening. And the hacking of attorney's legal product is a violation of legal proceedings, uh, a very serious violation. Do you have anything to add to that, Anna? No, I, I just, the word data set was not, like you said, was not in my vocabulary, so I could never end there. there. And that's number one. And as to the hacking, uh, you very well said it. It's a crime, particularly when it has to do with attorney work product and attorney client communications. But whoever's doing it, I uh, believe that they are above the law and that they will not face any consequence. So that's a very serious matter that we will we hope to one day take on with the court and um, and see who is responsible for for the hacking. Because this, as you know, it's not just this little word inserted in a paragraph, but also, you know, the encryption of my computer the day before the brief was due. So yeah, it is, it is, and everything leaves a trace. So we will take this on, hopefully. I think we must, <laughs> and I think we will. And it seems to be this substitution aligns to the strategy of changing the database to data set. And so if you ask who would benefit from it, Obviously, the defendants would be the beneficiary of this illegal substitution. I just want to say that sometimes it feels like, you know, I am 5'4", okay? That I have been put in a basketball court playing against LeBron James with my heights, my hands tied to my back. But yet I'm still winning. And I, I know we're going to win. But that's how it feels sometimes. It's people that don't know how to play fair. I applaud your efforts. You called yourself a one-woman band, and I absolutely love that comparison. That gave me a visual that put a smile on my face. And I actually tweeted about that, one of my favorite statements in our previous podcast. That was just magnificent. Now I think of you as a woman band, and it's true. You do all of that and you produce well-written legal products. So more power to you. Moving on. Number seven, the data set, here's that data set again, contains the names of known and suspected terrorists. And of course, we know, and you point out, People that do not meet the terrorist criteria are also placed on the list under secret criteria. Where did that statement come from, Anna? Well, that's exactly, that's the, first of all, aside from the fact that data set is not accurate and, and incorrect, it, it had to say the database contains the names of known suspected terrorists and people that do not meet the reasonable suspicion criteria of terrorism. But that omission goes to the gist, to, to the crux of the controversy. And you know what's, it, it, it's it's just like, uh, if the court had simply verified that all the, of course, that all the plaintiffs are there, this, this, this controversy, this, this wouldn't even be necessary because it's a matter of innocent people are on a terrorist database. And here, uh, the court intentionally omitted that detail, which is the crux of the complaint, the nucleus of the complaint. So that's why I say, you know, it's misleading because it, it omits the pink elephant in the middle of a living room. That's so true. Beautifully explained. We are up to number eight. The plaintiffs refer to the subset of names, individuals subject to exceptions to the reasonable suspicion standard as non-investigative subjects. And you answer, plaintiffs didn't make up this term. 
it derives from defendant's own documents. Yeah, that's precisely, um, that's that's uh, one of the arguments that uh, the Department of Justice uh, stated in its motion to dismiss, and a simple Google search would have let them see, as I mentioned before, 22,000 results of the word non-investigative subject, and it comes from the United States Department of Justice, the same Department of Justice that alleged to the court, we the plaintiffs made up that term, that same Department of Justice audit reports of the Terry Screening Center refer to non-investigative subjects. Here the court adopts that representation and says plaintiffs refer, no, we don't refer, we are quoting, plaintiffs are quoting from audit reports and it's a huge difference because one thing you know one statement seems like they made it up and the other is it's an uncontroverted fact that comes from official government documents and it's a huge difference it's not just an allegation it's an uncontested fact that defendants cannot deny because it comes from them i understand and i have a follow-up question to that, could it be possible that the non-investigative subject as a term is simply an outdated term, something that they used before, and then they change the language to something new, and we are not privy to those documents that define that change. So that doesn't mean that we made it up. It simply means that they use a different terminology. Could this be the case, Anna? I really don't think so because it's it's a law enforcement term, you know, and and I and it's in all of the audit reports of the terrorist screening center they make reference to that, and it's like the term a person of interest. It's a law enforcement term, and 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 the, I like to make this comparison because the, so people understand the sheer unfairness of this a person of interest you cannot maintain a person for of interest in an investigation forever because there is such a thing as statute of limitations you either investigate or you leave them alone but you you cannot have this shadow hovering over this person as a person of interest a, in a case and and so the non-investigative subjects for all practical purposes are permanently designated as persons of interest because they're labeled as suspected terrorists. And, and so, you know, if one, it, it's just the unfairness of it is non-investigative subjects. If, if you are a non-investigative subject, you have no business because that means no investigative means they don't have to be investigated. You have no business. Your name does not belong in a terrorist database. And and they they coined the term, you know we no no plaintiff coined the term, and, and that's why we emphasize it's incorrect, it's erroneous to say plaintiffs refer to it. No, it is it is designated like that. It is named like that in these reports that are uncontroverted, that are official documents from defendant. Well, actually, DOJ is not a defendant, but Merrick Garland is a defendant, but from the United States Department of Justice that is defending the FBI and the DHS and the uh, official capacity defendants. Yes, certainly. The non-investigative subject sounds extremely unfair. If something happens to me and the law enforcement is not going to investigate it, it is a violation of my rights. So extremely unfair. Second class citizen, so many terms can't come to mind. And this is just, is simply wrong. Number nine, the plaintiffs allege that Ray Cable Mallorcas and Weinstein have disclosed data set, including plaintiffs' names to at least 18,000 state, local, country, city, university, and college, tribal, and federal law enforcement agencies foreign governments and various private organizations. And you correct them and you explain that it's the FBI 
through its National Crime Information Center system distributed the TSDB. Please explain the difference between the statement by the court and how you rebuttal it. And nowhere in the complaint does it state that those individual defendants, or even in their official capacity, are the ones that distribute the list. It is clearly stated it's the FBI. And that's one of the Privacy Act violations that we allege because they are distributing false information about innocent people, labeling them as suspected terrorists. And that has been uh, decided by the Supreme Court that constitutes, that creates concrete harm, that constitutes injury in fact. It is never alleged in the complaint that Ray, Cable, Mallorcas, and Weinstein disclose it. What they do are other things. For example, Ray and Cable continue to endorse the policy of and include uh, people that they know, that they have actual knowledge, that don't meet terrorist criteria in the terrorist screening database. That's why, that's part of the reasons why they are included as defendants. As to Mallorca and Weinstein, you know, they, they implement, they establish and implement the policies carried out throughout the 99 fusion centers throughout the United States. As you very well know, fusion centers are the ones that carry out the a lot of the psyops and the break-ins and, and uh, the organized stalking of people. So it is not alleged that they are the ones distributed. So that is absolutely incorrect and contrary to what is alleged in the complaint, aside from the fact that the complaint does not allege it's the data set that is distributed, rather it's a data set, database. So that's why it's erroneous on two grounds. Yes, it seems to me, and this is my impression, that the court dismissal, uh, the district court dismissal, is so loose with language that it just does not appear that it treats it as a serious matter. This this looseness of language, we plead, we plead one thing, and they just rephrase it just in any way they want. There's something wrong with it. And I don't know, I don't want to create any... Uh, conspiracy theories, although there's nothing wrong with conspiracy theories, it's just simply uh, people working together without the scrutiny of the public eye. But where did this looseness of language come from? Do you have any ideas, uh, Anna? I don't know where it comes from because it, certainly it was suggested by the Department of Justice. And, and what's very ironic about it is that one of the reasons why Merrick Garland, the attorney general, is a defendant in the case is precisely because he has failed to observe, to um, force, let's put it that way, FBI and, T and the Terry Screening Center to adhere to its own regulations because they're not supposed to put innocent non-terrorists on a terrorist database. And it, since, since the FBI is an agency under the Department of Justice, is it within the purview of the Attorney General to make sure they are looking out for the civil rights of people. Here, we have an Attorney General that instead of doing that, even though we have plaintiffs have established prima facie, that, uh, you know, the skeleton that, that uh, a, a, the allegations uncontroverted allegations that that is not being done, that their civil rights and their privacy rights are not being respected. The Department of Justice chooses to defend this conduct instead of condemning it. And, and that's one of the reasons also he is a defendant in his official and in his individual capacity uh, because it is plaintiff's contention that he is not adhering to his mandatory duties as attorney general. Thank you, Anna. And we're up to number 10, which is the last false and misleading, misleading statement of the day. I, if you are still watching, I applaud your patience. It means that you're truly interested in the particulars of this case, which is 
let's face it, the most important thing that is happening with the targeted community in a long, long time. Now, statement number 10, plaintiffs have not produced, do not possess, and apparently have not seen the list they allege exists. Well, <laughs> duh, <laughs> district court denied the limited discovery on that issue. What a conundrum is so obvious on its face, but please give us your comments on it. Well, the first thing is that three months before the dismissal of the case, since three months before April 8th, plaintiffs have been requested a limited discovery on this matter because when defendants started talking about fantastical and bizarre and all those uh, offensive terms, we said, no, no, wait a minute. This is not made up. Let's get like, we want, plaintiffs want limited discovery to prove this is not made up. And the court didn't adjudicate it contrary to district court regulation and, and procedure. The court didn't adjudicate it in three months. And in, in the, this memorandum and order dismissing the case said, oh, we're denying the discovery as moot. It wasn't moot because it went to the crux of the controversy of the matter. The courts all know that the FBI doesn't give information. It's always, we do not confirm or deny. And they know that, of course, the plaintiffs are not going to have the list. That's why they're in court, because not only do they want to see the false information about them in those lists, but also prove their case. And no court expects a plaintiff to walk into court with all the evidence in their hand, because that then discovery wouldn't be needed. That's the purpose of discovery that plaintiffs have a right to in order to prove their case. So... That statement is very misleading because, you know, the court knows that FBI does not give information, not even to people that are in handling codes one and two. They still send them a letter saying we do not confirm or deny, even though the person cannot board a plane. They send them back letters saying we do not confirm or deny. So it's called stonewalling. And so I, this really surprised me because the, the two allegations, both by Stewart and Calvert, are very, they, they have well-pled facts that suffice Federal Rule of Serial Procedure 8 standard of giving notice. That, that your complaint has to give notice to the adverse party of what your allegations are. They don't have to be like to, you know, with a mathematical precision. And, and we, in this complaint, we went way beyond that because as I have repeated many times, most of it derives, I, I copied and pasted from uncontroverted government documents, a lot of the pleadings in this complaint. I didn't make them up. So that, that statement just goes to prove uh, the unreasonableness of denying a smooth three months later the request for limited discovery yes and this concludes our false and misleading statements part one so we went through number one to number 10 the total is 22 so 10 down 12 to go it will be the subject of our next podcast episode well now we through with our legal uh, segment, and it's time to speak to our special guest, Tarun Ravi, who is a, a U.S. citizen, has been working for IBM and Ford, and has uh, an extensive um, experience and background in software engineer in software development, who is currently in India. Tarun, Tarun, you are joining us from India, and we would like to hear from you about your experience and anything else you would like to tell our viewers, please. Sure. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to the TI community. Uh, you, Dr. Lenbeer, and uh, lawyer Anna Toledo. Uh, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. And uh, I have been a targeted individual for more than almost 20 years now. Uh, uh, I have a more than like 12 to, 15, 12 to about 12 to 15 years experience of, as a software developer and a software engineer. Uh, working at IBM and Ford Motor Company. 
and uh, I was targeted when I was living in Detroit uh, suburbs at the time I was working at Ford Motor Company and uh, uh, the the perpetrators the gang stalkers they used to stalk me on the internet forums and uh, threaten me issue threats to me uh, multiple times and they also basically post comments on internet forums uh, with embedded responses to my private thoughts uh, this started happening when i lived in the detroit suburbs area later you know uh, i thought if i move to move out of detroit maybe you know they will leave me alone these uh, perpetrators so I moved to Atlanta and I was there for about uh, six to nine months and this uh, gang stalking and threats and, uh, you know, publicly uh, threatening me on the internet forums never stopped. So after that, I moved to California. Uh, I lived in San Jose, uh, Los Angeles, and then I moved to last currently living in Las Vegas. So I'll give a couple of examples how they uh, stalk me on the internet. Uh, I'll share my screen and I'll show you this thing. So if you can see this uh, threat message, you see this on, on January 2008, I discuss you know, the sport cricket on internet forums with other fans from England, Australia, New Zealand. So they come, they create fake names and they come there and they threaten me like this. If you see this message, you can see, they clearly said, police are mere pawns in their network. They're only useful for cleaning up when they have more pressing distractions. The only way, I can prove that I'm a real man is by taking my life. It's the only way to end their control of me. So they basically threaten me publicly. They will torture me until I commit suicide. So this, uh, they created a fake name, Bandava. So like this, they created so many. I'll show one more threat message to the TI community. Another message, uh, they were watching me, uh, even in my you know uh, apartment, illegally with video surveillance devices. If you see here, they clearly said, uh, due to their methods, they can access my address uh, when they please, no matter what useless precautions I take. And they leave little reminders of this ability. And uh, if you see the last paragraph, they said, I'm insignificant until I truly act. When that happens, it will be noticed and swift removal will be dealt. So basically, they threaten me that they will murder me. And they, they clearly told me that they've been uh, stalking me for seven years in 2008. So uh, approximately from 2002 or 2001, approximately. So that's like 20 years now. And so this is how they've been stalking me for a long time and issuing threat messages. And they also post uh, comments with embedded responses to my private thoughts. And I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, one day, I was living in San Jose and I thought, why am I suffering? You know, all these things. And I thought maybe because my birth date is my, you know, unlucky number. My birth date is eight. So I thought it's in my unlucky number. So the evil psychopaths read my private thoughts and made a phone call, phone call to my cell phone number by spoofing this number, 888-888-8888. That's how they communicate with me, you know, in different modes, by uh, e with emails, threatening me on the internet forums, making phone calls to me, leaving messages, threatening messages, stuff like that. So if you see this, uh, this was on 2007. In 2007, they called me from this number, 888-888-8888. That's how they communicated with me, that they knew that I was thinking inside my mind that eight is my unlucky number. So this is how they communicate with me, you know, all the time. And I'll give you a couple of more messages, I mean, examples. And this is, these are my symptoms my torture symptoms, the electronic harassment. Uh, I was subjected to uh, sleep deprivation. So in the middle of the night, they give me electronic jolts. So I wake up suddenly because my body shakes and vibrates. And this remote limb jerking, uh, my fingers, my feet, sometimes my thigh muscles, they move, they jerk. You know, it, uh, I feel a jerking motion, uh, like involuntary. I can tell they are doing it, you know, remotely. They are operating my body, my brain, my limbs, you know, making me move my limbs and stuff like that. So I feel sometimes these bee stings uh, in my fingers, feet, and I get uh, ha fast heartbeat once in a while, the blurred vision, and the microwave voice to skull. They beam uh, different, different types of noises, you know, bizarre noises into my brain when I was asleep, sometimes when I'm awake, 
and i also they manipulate my dreams they alter my mood this is how they have been torturing me for the last 20 years i'll give you a couple of more examples for example so one day i knew i was under you know complete total surveillance video and audio surveillance in my apartments and uh, in my apartment so i was at my brother's place in san jose and i thought how, how do i communicate with my brother uh, without being you know uh, without them knowing what i'm what i'm telling my brother so i thought i'll write it on a piece of paper and give it to my brother so he can read it and throw it away you know to communicate with him privately i was just trying to find privacy you know and they read my private thoughts and posted this message if you want to pass information privately one of the best ways is chalking on a slate so that's how they suggested to me you know to use a slate to communicate with my brother privately in this happened in 2006 almost like 17 years ago so this is how they stalk me on the internet and threaten me and they beam dreams into my brain remotely and this has been going on for you know 20 years more than 20 years now they also program people around me my friends my relatives my neighbors and when i play poker you know they remotely program poker players on the table who are strangers to me to say something to me based on my private thoughts you know and they have been doing this even outside in outside america you know this happened inside america and outside america also you know even in india and they program my niece like 5 year old niece one day i was you know i read on the internet that uh, uh, it's better to the, a dentist suggested people to drink the soda uh, with a straw to avoid contact you know between the soda and our teeth so our enamel is protected so i read it on the internet and then one day i was in my brother's place and i took out a coke can from the fridge and i used a straw to drink the coke and i thought in my in my mind oh i was being smart prote- protecting my teeth so within one minute they programmed my 5 year old niece to proactively tell me uh, uncle you are being very smart using a straw to drink coke so they programmed my 5 year old niece to say that to me they have been doing this for the last 20 years and i am the only targeted individual who was able to perceive this specific aspect of remotely programming human minds to talk to email to text and act and this and they knew the evil us government knew that Uh, i have extraordinary perception abilities and this what this is what they have been doing to me for years now the directed energy weapons a lot of t- targeted individuals are being uh, persecuted and tortured with directed energy weapons but these weapons that i am talking about are different they are mind control weapons or neuro weapons and these technologies were explained by the deep state whistleblower brian hoffer back in 2017 he said the evil us government hired hundreds of private companies like securities industry specialists this company is uh, uh, present in many states like texas in austin texas uh, los angeles seattle he worked at uh, the seattle branch uh, he posted a few videos on on youtube and he also posted some podcasts explaining how these neuro weapons are being used to torture millions of americans i can show you a, a video a minute or two if you have time right now all high mind behavior manipulation technology the true control grid is this technology super computer software programming will manipulate the emotions and behavior and the thoughts of everybody in the united states of america and it can all be done remotely it's very much like the microchip kind of uh tracking the new world order this entire you know uh control grid that's supposed to be rolled out against the american people some day and i'm here to tell you that uh it's already here the way it works is a device broadcasts a radio frequency let's say at an individual and that radio frequency will hook up with the resonant frequency of the individual's mind or body or in this case dna and then this information the dna of the individual is used to determine the resonant frequency of the dna itself the resonant frequency is then used to fine tune the technology the radio frequency signals the microwave auditory effects and all the other aspects of the technology 
to tune it perfectly to the resonant frequency of the targeted individual's DNA. This is one of the reasons why many targeted individuals believe that there are nano technology, nanobots inside of their body, smart dust, things of this nature, nanofibers that completely fill the target's body. And based on some of the scientific papers that I've seen written on this, this is possible and it is going on. Uh, but it is a lower form of the technology. It is a less advanced form of the technology. The true holy grail in terms of this technology is DNA resonant frequency. It taps right into the DNA and it does it remotely by resonating with the exact frequency that your DNA resonates. And what happens is once the resonant frequency is found in the targeted individual and the broadcast frequency matches up with that resonant frequency, those two frequencies interlock and they can be thought of as one frequency or one energy. And what happens is between the broadcast frequency and the individual that's receiving the broadcast frequency, once it's resonating, uh, once they are resonating together, a, a super highway of frequency along which information can be sent is created. And so you can think of it just like fiber optic cables that you use to send uh, signals over the internet that connect people to the internet. It's the exact same thing, only a wireless application of that. And so once you have connected the targeted individual with the frequency um, and they resonate together, then you have a perfect um, avenue upon which to send and receive information back and forth. And that's exactly how they manipulate someone's thoughts. They send voices into someone's head. Uh, they manipulate their emotions. They manipulate their behavior. And then that's also how they receive back from the in individual in real time uh, the vital signs, the emotions, the thoughts, uh, what the person's seeing, what the person's hearing. And then all that information, of course, is rendered on a computer elsewhere uh, via software, and it can be monitored and tracked in real time. So that's how they basically manipulate our thoughts, our emotions, our memories, and our behavior, you know, remotely with these neuro weapons. Once they connect our brain's DNA resonant frequency to the supercomputer AI at the back end, they have complete control over our mind and body. So the entire central nervous system, they can control remotely. And they can remotely operate our limbs, our body, our fingers, our feet. They can, you know, create jerking motions. They can do electronic nudges and prods, basically. So this is how they've been torturing millions of Americans for the last 40 to 50 years. And I'll show you one more video. And this is very important. He clearly said that they can see on their monitors what targeted individuals see in the real world. For example, I'm watching this laptop, right? This... Uh, monitor right now so they can see on their monitors what i'm watching with my own eyes in the real world that's what he said and he explained the technology i'll show you that video too it can be used to turn groups of people or individuals against each other uh, for whatever purpose the entire point of this uh social engineering program that has been researched and developed for decades now uh, the full intent within the program, everything that's planned going forward, the day-to-day -day attitude of all the people, is that this program is going to be rolled out nationwide and it will become the norm. Every man, woman, and child in America will be under the influence of this technology. And as you can see going forward, what's going to happen is a, is a dividing line is going to be drawn in America. And it's not going to be Democrat or Republican or black and white, rich, poor, you know, Jew, Gentile, religious differences, whatever it is. It's going to be based on who is on the right and the wrong side of this technology, who is on the right and the wrong side of this program. And so if you are not a part of this program, then there is a very real risk that you are going to become a full-blown, 24-7 targeted individual. And this technology at that point when it is nationwide will be used by automated computer, supercomputer software programming uh, that will manipulate the emotions and the behavior and the thoughts of everybody in the United States of America. And it can all be done remotely. It's very much like the, the microchip kind of 
uh, tracking the New World Order, this entire, you know, uh, control grid that's supposed to be rolled out against the American people someday. And I'm here to tell you that uh, it's already here. Anna, you have something to say? No, I just, I just have to say that um, I don't know if you know this, Taryn, but I have a wireless body area network. I have hundreds of chips in my head. And okay. one of the things that I have found, uh, if, if anybody can say that these criminals could have absolute control of, it's me. And they don't because I do not negate the free will that targeted individuals have to combat this. And and I I you know I just I I don't want to give them absolute control. I, and but you know Len knows that I I cry a lot because they give me emotional bumps and, st and stuff. But I I choose to stand up again. So I don't I mean I I don't I I don't like a you know I I don't like to promote that message. And I'm not you know I'm not interfering with with you, but because because I like to big hope. I like to give hope. I like to give hope to people saying, doesn't matter their science. There is something within us that it's a strength that we can project and we can beat them. And the proof of that is that it doesn't matter how much technology they have and how many trillions of dollars they have spent in this. We are a force to be reckoned with and we, are winning so i i i personally you know i i stay away from that message because i want to empower ti's i don't want them to think that they are powerless in the face of this all-encompassing technology i don't know how you feel about it but i that's that's why i you know i i I, I feel uncomfortable with it because of that, but but I'm not I'm not curtailing your your free speech. I'm just telling you that I want to give hope to people that they don't have absolute control. You have absolute control. They can tweak you, they can harass you, but we have control because we have an inner power. My two cents. <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. I mean, we have to be mentally strong, you know, to survive all these tortures, you know, literally every day. So, you know, each targeted individual is targeted in a different way. Some people are targeted with microwave weapons, acoustic weapons, uh, electromagnetic weapons, and some people are targeted with uh, neuro weapons, artificial intelligence, you know. So that's how they've been experimenting and torturing different, different types of, uh, using different types of technologies. So, And so I people get it all. So yeah, yeah, get, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just want to give hope to people yeah. that they don't, that they are not almighty, that we can yeah. beat them at their yeah. game. Hopefully, yeah. Okay, so, sorry for my interruption, but Len, Len call me in. Uh, no problem. Point is well taken, Anna. That's why we have a disclosure that the opinion of our guests are not necessarily the opinions of targeted justice, but we we allow our guests to share their experience and share uh, what's important to them because we all have to be able to share our thoughts, uh, our hopes, and in our situations, and that this is exactly what Tarun is doing. So, Tarun, do you have anything else to add to this, uh, to your message, before I ask you uh, questions that uh, interest me? Uh, sure. I just I just want to show one item more. Psychologist, she's a psychologist, uh, Dr. Carol Smith. She published this column two, uh, 20 years ago, in 2003. She explained how targeted individuals are being tortured. Here she explained in this column how we are being tortured. Part of the effort is to remind the victim that they, are, that they are constantly under control or surveillance. And she explained these mind control weapons, uh, directed energy weapons, how we are being tortured, different symptoms. So if the uh, TI community reads this, it will be great. 
it's uh, dr carol smith she's a psychologist she published this in 2003 20 years ago see the interesting thing is that psychologists and psychiatrists are not concerned about the fact that entering a person's mind, taking over and, 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 and manipulating their thoughts is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And, exactly. uh, and, and they just, they, they, it just you know, goes over their head. They, they don't realize the legal implications of the right to be safe in their own persons and things. And the persons includes their brain. Uh, yeah. it, so without unreasonable searches and seizures. And that's exactly what that is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nobody should have the right to invade our brains and manipulate our behavior. You know, it's like there is no existence uh, for the meaning. There is no meaning for the existence of human species. If uh, the government is reading and programming our brains remotely and altering our behavior, you know, there is no meaning for our existence. It's like there is no, we have no free will, uh, no privacy of thoughts, emotions and memories, you know, that kind of stuff. So with that, I just want to tell the TI community that uh, we should stick together uh, no matter what. And we should uh, fight the evil government uh, with the help of uh, lawyer Anna Toledo and uh, Dr. Len Bair. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. I appreciate you know, this opportunity. Thank you, Throne, right. for your thoughts, for your uh, presentation. I have a specific question. When you contacted me, you shared some court documents from Karantaka uh, District Court in India with the judge's order to investigate whether Havana syndrome is happening in India. And the person who filed the complaint, uh, the petitioner, is Amaranth Chagul. And uh, his lawyer is Mr. Srikant. And then there's a government official charged with the investigation, Aditya Singh, uh, with the Department of Telecommunication. Have you made any headways to help the investigation and help the petitioners? Uh, because you are in India, I'm here in the United States. It's hard for me to establish contacts. I. I asked other people to get in touch with the people involved in the case. What have you been able to do uh, from where you are, Tarun? I tried to, you know, uh, get their uh, contact information, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to, you know, uh, I wasn't successful. Uh, Mr. Amarnath Chagu, he was the petitioner who filed this public interest litigation in Karnataka High Court, uh, requesting the Indian government, the Karnataka High Court, ordered the Indian government to investigate this Havana syndrome and submit a report within three months. And uh, I somehow managed to find his workplace email address and I emailed him uh, yesterday morning. He hasn't responded to me yet. And I also emailed the Indian government, Mr. Aditya Singh, uh, the, nam the name mentioned in the court document yesterday evening. Uh, I haven't received any response yet, but uh, we should wait a couple of more days because I emailed him yesterday evening, Friday evening, and today and tomorrow is a weekend, so we should uh, you know wait until probably Monday or Tuesday, a couple of more days to see if I get any response. And other than that, I organized a press meet uh, with the local newspapers and uh, you know local uh, media uh, about ten days ago, and I explained to them a little bit about this Havana syndrome and these directed energy weapons and uh, uh, neuro weapons you know, of that nature. So they published my name and I also told them that you are a very high profile victim, Dr. Len Bear. And I also told them that the lawyer Anna Toledo is fighting on behalf of targeted individuals in America and she filed a court case. And I mentioned all these things and they published this information in a couple of newspapers, local newspapers, you know, vernacular press. So that's what I've been doing. You know, I'm doing you know, the best I can to you know, get as much exposure as possible uh, to the targeted individual community and also educate you know uh, the Indian public about all these weapons and technologies and how we are being persecuted. And uh, there are a couple of other uh, victims, uh, Indian victims, who one, one guy was working at Microsoft as a software engineer in Seattle, and he couldn't take these tortures anymore you know, uh, from the from the evil US government. So he came back to India one year ago and he has been living here. Uh, and another lady, uh, she's from Texas. She used to live in uh, Dallas area and work there. 
and i think she's a biomedical engineer engineer and she she also was uh, targeted with all these neuro weapons and uh, dews so she couldn't take the tortures anymore and she came back to india she's living in india now so i'm in touch with them and uh, i'm also doing you know uh, networking in the local uh, indian targeted individuals to uh, to see if we can uh, do more to educate the indian public so that's what i've been focusing on for the last uh, couple of weeks thank you tarun i hope you. Uh, that uh, you can do more in the karnataka uh, case because yeah. this is a tangible case just like targeted justice v garland yes. in yes. Uh, in the united states and we should take a full opportunity of this investigation even if the government is not interested in coming to a right conclusion we should make our efforts known that we want of uh, this atrocity to be known and we want to help the investigation uh, and it should be an effort from people like you from people like us mm -hmm. from uh, all the experts uh, associated with targeted justice uh, associated with, with ICATOR. I'm calling upon everybody from Barry, Barry Trower to Melanie Rishan and everybody in between to actively influence this investigation so thank you for playing part in this effort to run uh, i believe you already uh had your uh final words uh, for the targeted yeah. community i would like to hear from anna what kind of takeaway you would like our viewers to have from today's show my takeaway is the truth when you speak the truth you do not need a good memory TIs, many of them have sustained a loss of memory because of the directed energy uh, weapons attack, but their story never changes uh, because, because they speak the truth. Uh, and we will continue to be speaking the truth until the court or any other authority sets us free. As for me, I'm calling this episode false and misleading statements part one today we reviewed the first 10 false and misleading statements made by the district court judge in her dismissal of our case in houston district court but there is a total of 22 of them why are there so many why was the judge so loose with the language and her treating of our well-articulated fact-based pleadings I can't read the judge's mind, but one thing is painfully obvious. The judge is biased toward our complaint. I believe in our judicial system. This is the ultimate place where we go when our rights are wrongfully taken away and when we exhausted all other remedies. And by doing so, we count on fair, neutral, and impartial treatment of our complaints. Instead, our pleadings were met with undeniable bias by the district court judge. This was disappointing. This was more than disappointing. This was a quintessential declaration of prejudice. We have high hopes for the honorable judges in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. We are confident they will see through the bias by the district court judge demonstrated in such an obvious and discernible way. This is where the 22 false and misleading statements come into play. But if we're allowed to go back and have our day in court, and I have no doubt we will, what kind of treatment should we expect from the judge who expressed such an apparent bias toward our case? So what can we do to overcome this bias? I don't have all the answers, but we will keep looking for a solution to this problem together. Until then, we will be here every Sunday, rain or shine. Mm -hmm.